Hey, welcome to this first episode of, uh, I, I've been calling it the debrief in my head. I don't know, maybe you guys can suggest some names for it, but my name's Tyler Norton from Plastic Weekly, and I'm joined by John Bergman, who's uh, writing for Climbing Magazine covering the World Cup circuit. John, how are you doing this Monday morning? Doing well. I'm. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here, so I'm I'm excited. I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for, uh, for you having me on here, and it's going to be fun. Yeah, I think so. It was a really good World Cup to, to start because, like, I mean, first of all, there's the hype around just the first event of the season, which, like, I kind of already mentioned to you that some it's, sometimes it's hard for me to get past the first World Cup in the season, especially with, like, time differences and stuff. You can't always catch every event. Um, but aside from that, it is the first event of the Olympic season. Like, we are right now qualifying athletes for the Olympics. So I was gonna like call out all of like the big media hopping on the climbing story, but we're a hundred percent part of that wave of, of like of uh, hysteria around the Olympics. So I, I don't wanna call anybody out cause I know I'm like part of that problem too. But yeah, here we are. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, that's something that we, you and I kind of talked about um, a couple days ago was that there was definitely a noticeable kind of notch uh, an increase in the amount of buzz going into this world cup season compared to compared to to previous seasons at least at least i thought so and i was wondering if you know maybe it was just because i was kind of more tuned into the world cup chatter this this time around or maybe it's just because more people are on social media i don't know but it did seem like like there's just a little more excitement around sure. the start of this season than 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 previous years yeah there's consequences right away and i'm I like even just like um you know existing climbing publications that maybe didn't bother to cover every single world cup or didn't bother to have a correspondent on it they are now right and you could even just tell at Maringen the number of press vests was definitely up from before um you're seeing it looked like the athletes after the rounds were finished were dealing with like far larger gaggles of press trying to get interview questions um like charlie commentator who normally does those little interviews he got sidelined to basically having a minute which with each athlete um before he had to like give up the floor to those uh, other people presumably so that's a really cool sign and i mean coverage is the most important part for us if we want to grow the sport so like that's sick i'm really excited for that um but speaking of just like the amount of press the part i have like i want to talk about the climbing right away but i can't get over how first thing like one of my favorite stories of the comp was Oceana McKenzie making it to finals and not totally flubbing it. Like I love an underdog story, but so often they get far and then they get wrecked in a final round. She actually held her own, but then you get the official results on the stream saying that she finishes in fourth. You get the official IFSC tweet saying she finishes in fourth. You get the press release from the IFSC press office saying she finishes in fourth. And then later on, we start to see on their website and on the results app that she's now finished in six, that she lost a bonus. And so I was kind of going around trying to figure out what's going on, talking to other people in the media and then eventually talking to athletes. So it turns out that she was appealed on her uh, start to women's number three in finals where she didn't establish a stable start. Um, I'm not calling out the, the call. Like I think it's reasonable that the call was upheld, it wasn't as stable a start as some other people. But the huge issue for me is that like anybody that just watches the stream, which I think you'd agree is pretty much everybody, they left that event or they left that like that broadcast thinking that Oceana finished in fourth, just like one spot away from the podium in her second World Cup ever. And it turns out that that's not the case at all. And if you're like me and you, like you were writing for Climbing Magazine with those results that were like official, they said they were official. And then they got changed. Nobody told us on the broadcast. The tweet from the IFSC still says that she's in fourth, even though she's in sixth. Nobody's like sent out a clarification to the press release. And it's just driving me nuts because now that you have all of this press coverage, can't even get like accurate results out. And that's just like left such a bad taste in my mouth right at the beginning of the season. It just sucks, man. I don't know. Yeah. And there's a couple things to kind of to discuss related to this. And the... The first is, as as climbing is going kind of towards the Olympics, and and with that, getting more into the mainstream consciousness, you can't help but think of it compared to other sports, right? Sure. Competition climbing compared to other sports, and in other sports, anytime um, there, like like the call is whatever call happens during the game, 
Mm -hmm. that call stands. Now, maybe there there could be, you know, slow motion, instant replay or whatever in the moment. You know, yeah. and like some sports have the referees are able to kind of review the call and maybe change it on the spot. But once the game ends, it, controversy or not, whatever call was made, like, that's it. You know, think about soccer, think about um, baseball, think about basketball. Like, these sports don't a day or two days after the the competition they don't the, or after the game they don't go back and say oh well never mind the score is changed and and you know maybe this team won or instead sure it just it, it so it's interesting that climbing um has that model for competitions mm -hmm. yeah uh, because it's it's very different from how other sports do it and it and we can see kind of case in point here it can affect um the the press after the fact what i'm concerned about is that like first of all i don't know when this appeal was filed and when it was um uh what's the word like uh we'll say finalized or accepted um so this appeal like could have happened during the round right and then somewhere along the line maybe it was a communication issue where that information didn't get to the broadcast team or the press team, which is a problem in its own, right? Mm -hmm. um, because your viewership is is your audience, your broadcast is your product. You have to make sure you've got an excellent, accurate product. So it could have been a communication thing, or maybe it was a late appeal. I like the appeal um, process has changed a little bit this year, and that's always been an area where I've been like pretty fuzzy on on you know the protocol for making appeals and when they can be accepted and not. So I think there's a chance the appeal was late, possibly after the um, uh, the flower presentation or whatever. Uh, but either way, like it's it's not a great look, and especially as you like if my thing is. Climbing is becoming an Olympic sport, and that carries a lot of, like, first of all, weight, like, there's a certain amount of gravitas, but also it's kind of an area of sport where there's a lot of, like, controversy, there can be a lot of, like, questionable uh, business practices, um, just the way athletes work when you start dealing with doping and cheating accusations, and especially in a sport where there's judging involved, and root setters who you really don't have a way to guarantee that they're, you know, partial or impartial. This is like this is exactly the time where you want to start getting the press on your side because as you get further deep into this rabbit hole there's going to be far more criticism of your sport. So things like this you like this was brought to their attention ahead of time. They should know this. It should have been corrected already. They need to fix this stuff cuz I know like BBC, whatever the Japanese news organization is, you know for sure that they published a story within an hour of that event being done, right? They have stars in their country. They need to know the right stuff and BBC is not going to be happy if they find out later that their stories are inaccurate because their primary source of information was like totally flubbing it. That's kind of like garbage to me. I don't know. That's a real bummer. Yeah, and this extends beyond just I, uh, it's like you don't want to pick on the IFSC too much because this is the model that every... I kind of do, but anyway. Well, but as far as I know, what I, I mean, this is the model, and maybe it trickles down from the IFSC, which is a good point, but I mean, this is the model that, that as far as I know, most, if not all, of the, the national federations have, um, you know, appealing, and then, and then kind of there's a deliberation period, and then, and then they'll announce it. So it's not something, it's something that that every federation not just globally but every you know every national federation or, or governing body needs to needs to think about because it's it's definitely a bad look i mean let's think it, it was a little different because it went oceana oceana went from from fourth place to sixth place mm -hmm. so it didn't affect the the podium no. But imagine if it had been like first and second place, sure, right? And and so they do the the award ceremony and they give out the the first place and medals and all this, and then like a day later, um, it's like all that is sort of negated a little bit. That yeah. would have been a PR nightmare. And that said, it's possible that this decision was made before the podiums, and we just didn't find out. But that's my problem: is that something happened along the way, and the audience was never told of the reality. That's it, like. Australia must be hyped off their fucking face because Oceania, this is her second World Cup. In her first World Cup last year, she got into semis. In her second World Cup ever, she gets into finals. That's like an incredible national achievement. And then you have this kind of thing that just kind of like ruins it a little bit. And that, anyway, I don't want to get too deep into this because a lot of great climbing happened. But it's just like we need this information to come out because like you and me, two like guys on the internet who are just trying to put out content around this sport need that stuff. And all the way up to, like I said, places like the BBC or whoever's covering it, they need accurate information. Like this stuff, you can't, like right now as we're recording, the tweet still says that she came in fourth place. Nobody sent me an email correcting the press release. That just 
has to be fixed. So let's hope this is the last time that this stuff comes up. But well, anyway. and yeah, and the only other thing, the, the, the kind of other thing that I wanted to say was that I hope that this controversy, or not, not really controversy, but whatever you want to call it, you know, I hope that this doesn't become the story. Um, around Oceana, right? I oh, hope that, sure, yeah. I hope that, because the, the fact is, her her performance for the whole weekend was really remarkable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it was kind of a breakout performance. It was a coming out party in a lot of ways for, for her on, on kind of the main stage. Um, it's funny, I remember when you did your predictions for who was going to make it to the to the olympics for mm-hmm. each country you know you did that a few weeks ago um that was right around the time that i was actually sitting down just kind of for fun out of my own curiosity and making my own predictions and i got to uh, the the oceania continental championship and yeah. i was thinking like i don't you know i don't i'm not familiar with very many of the competitors from this region at all and so i started looking into um like youth competition ifsc youth competitions where the competitors who were there might be you know of of age to compete in the olympics in 2020 and and i came to oceana and i i said wow this this lady you know this she's got some really great youth results she does, yeah. um so I, I ended up picking her um and f- as a as a as a you know, as a pick for the Olympic berth mm-hmm. at the those Oceania Continental Championships, um, not really being that familiar with her. Sure. And and then um, all of a sudden, you know, this World Cup happens, and it's kind of like now she she just I mean she's announced her 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 I mean she she was on the scene before this, but this was really her, uh, the big announcement that she's a major sure. player. She was one uh, of the two like the stories from this weekend, in my opinion, and maybe you disagree, but first one is crack climbing is back <laughs> in the international competition scene, and the other one is Oceana. Like those are the like the best stories. Um, I think you know for a continent that hasn't seen a lot of your know, representation, especially since like James Cassay kind of. Yep. stop climbing it's great to see them back and she's not like you know i i like i said i get concerned when you get that dark horse into finals because the likelihood is they're not going to perform the same way in semis like semis often you can progress by having like a you know you have a somewhat good day if the route settings for you you're all set and then you get to finals and then you just get like wiped out as much as Oceana finished last in finals, she kept up with the rest of them. Like, what, three of them finished with one top, and she was yeah. one of them? And she crushed that climb. Like, she looked awesome on that. She looked of that tier. So, you know, maybe the next World Cups don't go the same way, but she held her own and, and made it feel really good. I'm sure the crowd was, like, really excited for somebody like that to be in there. Yeah, and she's not I, – I think she tweeted out or, or on her Instagram page, she she put out that she's not going to the next World Cup in Moscow next, mm-hmm. you know, this coming weekend, but she will be in the in the China ones. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, just the moral of the story, you know, good good on her for, for an awesome performance. Yeah. Let's talk about the rest of the field. Like, we kind of started doing this mostly thinking about the Canadian and American team. So, I don't know. What were your thoughts on, you know, how did, how did your – so, I'm Canadian, you're American – how did you feel this comp went for uh, for Team USA? You know, I thought. I mean, there were a lot of great storylines from from Team USA. Um, I think it was interesting because the, the I don't know if the people watching this might or might not be familiar with the fact that USA climbing has has really been kind of um, having they had a, they've had a lot of momentum this past year. They've done a lot of great things. They moved their headquarters from from Boulder, Colorado, to Salt Lake City, um, kind of under this this idea that you know they would really kind of amp up the competition climbing presence and the, and the USA climbing presence around the country the move would help them do that uh, they built a, a a really nice training facility just like a basically a private gym for the the members of team USA the national team uh, in Salt Lake City that's brand new uh, they've had team training camps there and they held held their own combined championship in um, in in January so so the USA climbing has has done a lot of good this past year and I was curious to see how that all of, all of that kind of extraneous stuff transferred to performance at the you know at the actual competition at, at the World Cup competition and um, so I wrote down this is this is interesting I've got it here I'm gonna kind of read this off so so I wanted to compare the start or, or how the Americans did this year after, you know, they've had all that 
kind of wonderful preparation and stuff compared to how they started the year last year at the Marion World Cup. Right. So in in 2018 at the at the World Cup there, Marion World Cup, they sent 10 athletes just like they did this year. Um, only two athletes, American athletes, moved on from qualifiers in 2018. Um, I think it was Maya Madera and Nathaniel Coleman. And so they, they had two athletes move out of qualifiers, but they did have three athletes who, even though they didn't move on, they placed in the top 30. Sean Bailey, Claire Burfine, and, and Brooke Rabatou placed in the top 30. Compare that to this year, um, where you had three athletes, right? Nathaniel Coleman, Alex Johnson, and Kyra Condi um, move on out of qualifiers. Um, but you only had, uh, let's see, of those who didn't move out of qualifiers, only one of them was in the top 30, mm -hmm. which was um, Brooke Rabatou, who was 29th, so yeah. kind of in there. So I don't know if people, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to people, but I think it's kind of like, it ends up coming out to be a, you know, it's it's a little different, but it's not. Like, it's 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 comparable to, to how things went last year, I think. Yeah, yeah. and it is one event, and, like, setting is always different for each event yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But were yeah. you, like, did you feel like uh, the team made you proud? Did you Were you happy with, like, how Kyra performed, especially in those last couple of problems of semifinals? Absolutely, yeah. Because I think if you, look, if you just look at the finals or if you just watch the finals, right, you see that there are no Americans there. So mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, that's it's kind of a bummer. But if you pan out a little bit and you see that, well, the Americans were seventh and eighth place for the women. Yeah. Um, uh, Kyra Condi was seventh and, and Alex Johnson was eight. Uh, no, that, Johnson was, right? Johnson was seventh. seventh and, and Kyra Condi was eighth. That's right. Um, so it's like if the if things had gone just a little bit differently, you know, if there had been a foot slip here, a foot slip there, um, the Americans could have had two women in the finals, um, which would have been, you know, pretty incredible. Um, I was a little bit disappointed at the end where Kyra like didn't put more time into problem number three in semis. I was kind of worried that that might have been a bit of a curse. I don't know. It felt like I don't want to say it felt greedy, like you have to make decisions, whatever. That's that's fine. But um, that that worried me, like giving one up in the hopes of, of a different one. And I mean, she's a far better athlete and she knows herself way better than I do. So it's up to you. But that part that always like I always feel like you jinx it at that point when you like kind of like sit down early from a climb. I feel like the bad karma like starts to build up right then. So that was a bummer because yeah. I felt like she, you know, coming out, uh, coming out in such a high position after qualifiers, I thought she was going to rock it. And it's really too bad about those last two problems because um yeah i was really excited to see her climb aj though like alex johnson being out of the scene for what eight years and yeah seven years i think something like that yeah. like uh, i i honestly did write her off as like this was just some fine kind of fun return she had a good performance at u.s nationals so why not hit the world cups again i was crazy impressed like this is a legit finish in this kind of field and she's the same age as like i am you know I'm not, I don't know. There's not many people born in 89 that are still on the comp circuit, right? Yeah. So that was really cool. I am I hope she can keep that up because I'm cheering for anybody that's as old as, you know, we are and still yeah. uh, still killing it. So that was uh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's it's incredible. And, and I think that, that, I mean, that's, how can you not say that that's one of the big storylines of not only you know the the american season leading into this but but hopefully of the of this world cup season is going to be alex johnson um uh, you know i i also coach uh, a youth team and uh, a few months ago we had our our youth regionals and uh, you know alex johnson coaches at a gym um and that just so happened to funnel into the same regionals right. as as me and so we were both we were both there um, in isolation. She was with her her kids, and I was with my kids. And I I remember like looking over and saying and thinking like, oh, that's Alex. That's that's Alex Johnson. She she used to be like, she, you know. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm a huge fan of her. And yeah. I was thinking like, she she was the queen for years of yeah. of the the comp scene. Thinking yeah. in my head like it's like in the past. It's right? over. Past yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I was like, wow, she used to be like the best in the world. And 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 here we are, just a few months later, and she's. She, she's she's still she's yeah, back man. on the scene and, yeah. and performing really well so yeah. 
um, it's it's just it's great. And I mean, I'm even older than you are, so I, mm. I love it. I love any time, <laughs> any time anybody is you know an older competitor. It's just exciting when they yeah. when they when they when they do well. And um, and I'm very intrigued to follow her. Mm-hmm. her career as or, or not her career her, her season mm-hmm. as as you know she goes to more more world cups and she's been invited to more world cups so we're gonna see her again yeah yeah i know it was really cool on the canadian side like for myself i i like the the results from the canadians were like pretty standard um it's about average now and and it kind of hurts to say but like sean mccall not always making semifinals like so this was about right. He mended some, somewhere around like 30th. And then Atlanta Yip making it to semis and, and doing some work in there. That was like pretty good. Um, so I think it was like kind of par for the course for the Canadians. Um, I think Sean's, it was a bummer though, because I think Sean's placing, it was really tough because the men's qualifiers were like so hard. You had you pretty much had to get five tops uh, to make it through. So him ending, I'm pretty sure it was with four tops and five bonuses. That was rough because I think, like that's kind of an indicator that he had a good day if he was effectively keeping up with everybody else, um, but just not you know at this particular comp it just wasn't enough to get the semis. So that was kind of a bummer after seeing his score and then realizing it wasn't gonna get him through. But I mean, what can you do, man? That's just yeah. how it goes. It's it's hard for us in Canada because Sean is like there's nothing that would make all of us way happier than seeing Sean and Alana at the Olympics. That would be the greatest thing in the world for us because i think we all think sean is the best competition climber to like ever exist like i think adam Andra will take that mantle at some point uh but sean so far especially at least for north america is is the best let's say for north america best comp climber all around um yeah. but in my opinion he's kind of on the 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 late end of his career whereas alana yip is towards the earlier end of her career. So I'm at a point where I do believe Atlanta has a better chance of, of going to the Olympics, all things considered. Um, but yeah, so it was pretty like average for us. No big stunners, but no huge disappointments. So like, I can't really complain. I think for us, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, and for for anybody, I mean, I agree with what you said about Sean McCall. He's, he's always been really fun to watch and he's certainly one of the best ever. Um, it's interesting when you look at people, Sean, and just kind of these other people that have been the names, the big names on the, the circuit for, for years, um, but now might be, you know, they're a little older, um, you can't help but feel a little sad, not maybe, you know, not not Sean specifically, just anybody in, in this position, because the Olympics, the Olympics kind of loom, and you know that a lot of these big names, these people that carry, you know, carry the mantle of competition climbing mm-hmm. for years, they're not going to make it. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I don't know if you want to say it's not fair, but it just, <laughs> it's like, you, you, you think of some of these people and, and you're like, well, they really kind of deserve to be on the Olympic team, uh, on the Olympic squad for their country because they've been the person yeah. for years. Yeah. And um, I, Sean, especially you think about him as, as just, Aside from being one of the like best climbers in the world and being a combined, you know, champion a few different times, he was one of the guys with that ultimate skill set. And you think back to like, what if the Olympics or what if climbing was in the Olympics in 2016, right? Like Sean would have been one of the top three contenders for that. He would have been legit right up there. Um, and you think for somebody like him where it's it's got to be hard to have as much motivation as an athlete like him has and cope with the biggest, you know, the biggest shining, you know, prize ahead of you is coming like in the later part of your career. That's got to like, that's got to hurt at some point. I, it feels terrible. Um, that's it, like, obviously still in the running. Everything in climbing is so volatile. Like there's no, it's a weird sport. Just let's see how the events go. Let's see what the route settings like. Let's see what the fields are like. You never know what could happen. Um, Canada treats him as an Olympic, you know, medal hopeful. Um, He's getting funded for that. Same thing with Atlanta, in fairness, I think. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. But it, I, I felt the same thing that you felt, man. It's, uh, it is a little bit cruel because as an ambassador for the sport, he's been one of those people lobbying for it to be in the Olympics. So maybe if he can't be there, at least he'll feel accomplished and that he managed to provide that, that Olympic dream to athletes in the future. So maybe that's yeah. a decent... Yeah, and and as you know, thinking about Americans, like you look at Daniel Woods and Alex Puccio, who mm. uh, you know Daniel Daniel Woods hasn't really been on the scene on the World Cup scene that much no. in the past years, recent years. But there was a time 
not all that long ago in the scheme of things when when Daniel Woods and Alex Puccio were the the biggest names in American competition climbing yeah. um and and they were they were shouldering a lot at a time when competition climbing wasn't nearly as popular as it is now um and and yet it doesn't seem like you know either one of them is is making a, a push for the Olympics at all no and um so it's just kind of it's just kind of interesting. It's just yeah. interesting to to think about these these names that have been kind of at the front of everybody's consciousness for the for years leading up to now, and yet um, it, it seems like maybe we're at kind of like a generational shift a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, you you think of look at like Sean McCall compared to Oceana McKenzie, and they it's like a different generation of climber, right? Sure. Um, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and and so we're kind of in the midst of that turnover. And one of the exciting things as the Olympics get closer is going to be, well, which which generation overall is going to is going to kind of get, <laughs> yeah. get more. Do you get more do you remember that year at U.S. Boulder Nationals? I can't remember what the younger three were, but uh, it was like three old climbers like our age. I say old, but like our age, I think yeah. it was like Angie Payne, uh, Alex Puccio and Alex Johnson and then three younger climbers. So like as a total guest, let's say Margot Hayes. uh who Brooke, else? Uh, Kyra and and somebody else. And I felt so much joy in my heart when the podium was like Angie and Alex and Alex, and just holding on to like the hope that our generation is relevant as competitors just a little bit longer. That was probably my favorite U.S. Nationals, whatever year that was. But yeah, um, and, and and that's why I mean that just kind of circles back to why the AJ storyline is so compelling. The Alex Johnson yeah. storyline is so is so compelling. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Aside from the Canadians and Americans, like any surprises for you in terms of the field? Anybody that you felt dropped out like way too low or anybody that got way further than you thought? Aside from the well, ones we've already spoken about? Yeah, let's I wanted to ask you this. I wanted to because there were some surprising exits. Uh some people that that if you had if we had talked before the before the competition took place, you know, and we were picking who was going to move on and then sure. compared to now, you know, after the competition there were some surprises with people that did not move out of qualifiers. Um, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm thinking Jakob Schubert yeah. did not did not make it out. Jessica Pills did not make it out. Um, Jan Hoyer did not make it out. Sean McCall, as you said. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, the biggest surprise was probably Jan Hoyer not not sure. not getting to semifinals. And I say that because I th I think Jakob and Jessica Pills were surprising in their own right but at the end of the day their bread and butter is i mean they're phenomenal boulders but their bread and butter is rope climbing right they're mm -hmm. lead specialists um whereas jan is he's he's a bouldering specialist there's no question about that uh and and so to have him not make it into semifinals um was was very surprising and i think you know that you could say the same thing about sean because sean mccall is is a you know he I mean, he kind of special. He he's kind of good at everything, every discipline. Mm -hmm. But he's he's really great at bouldering. But I think the difference why Jan was a little more surprising to me than Sean was because Sean is thirty one, I think, and mm. and Jan is twenty seven. And so anytime slightly and, slightly younger, yeah. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have a competitor who's over thirty, um, you kind of expect them to maybe have good days and bad days, right? A little a little more frequently than than somebody who's in their twenties in terms of their competition performance. Um, whereas Jan, you know, he's 27, he's still in his prime. Um, so I would have expected him to go to semis and he didn't. Yeah, the hard thing for me, like, again, because the men's round was so hard, um, or so easy, sorry, where you had so many tops everywhere, it was all those like little mistakes and the later you get in the day, and I mean, Jan was relatively early in the day, I think, just going by his like, you know, ranking and stuff. I don't I don't think there were really actually that many surprises because the field was just so deep. I was kind of like, well, you know, this will happen every time. When you look at who made to semis, like it feels like that's about right. There were a couple names that maybe wouldn't normally get in there. A couple names I didn't recognize at all. Um, Anji or like Angie, Anzi Payhart from Slovenia. I'd never heard that name myself. Um, I'm sure he's probably been to a couple World Cups. I could probably check right now, but anyways, not important. Um, the one that like I had to give a shout out to was Romain de Grange, who like bothered to show up for this. And I just yeah. wanted to thank him for coming out and trying. That was really cool. I'm yeah. sorry. It was so rough. But uh, yeah, that like, you know, I, I, uh, 
it makes me happy that they're coming out and seeing what they can do in this new combined world of climbing. And I just felt a little bit bad that it was such a harsh day for somebody like him. But cool, cool that he came out. Two, two tops, five zones, I think. That's not not bad. So thanks for trying, man. But Yeah, and he's yeah. he's one of those big names. <laughs> like like we were just talking about those big names. That were, <laughs> big you know, name, old guy, not that great in this discipline, but like still coming out. Yeah, it was great. And and that kind of leads me into something else that I that I think is worth talking about, which is the surprise the the surprise of the French team, the entire men's team not having anybody go yeah, man. beyond qualifiers. Nobody no no French man got into the semifinals. Mm-hmm. And that's very surprising. I mean, the, the French team is generally considered to have uh, some depth and to yeah. be, uh, you know, without question, one of the best kind of team squads in the in the whole in the whole world. Um, mm-hmm. It's too early to, you know. I was kind of thinking I was going to ask you, like, are you if you're the French coach or team manager, like, are you at all worried? That, you know, but it's just one competition. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's too I, early. I don't think I would judge off this. Like, I would never. You like if you're just determining like how good is a climber, you can't go off one comp, obviously. Right. Um, I, I would say like I think I think whoever's organizing Paris 2020 like talking about like bringing the Olympics back if they're seeing that the French team is like not getting anywhere if this trend keeps up I think they'll be a little bit worried but um, no that's probably not actually but uh, I think it was like maybe just uh, a bit surprising that with all of those men there there still wasn't one making it through it was a little bit disappointing I'm sure France like I mean Fanny Joubert did a great job of representing them but uh yeah we'll see how it goes over the next little bit because i still think of france as a huge climbing country but i have to admit that most of that is kind of a bias from the past when they were a much more dominant team right and they have been you know overtaken by the other alpine countries and by japan um so they need to kind of show a new renaissance if they want to look anything like the Japanese team does going to their home hosted Olympics. If France wants that kind of thing, they're, you know, France over the last couple of years is nowhere near the level that Japan is at right now. Like Japan, what they had seven of the top 10 out of this world yeah. cup, four of the top six and finals. Like that's pretty unreasonable, but it's also exactly what you'd expect. Like that is right. what I would guess going into this. So yeah, it's a little bit disappointing for the French, I guess. It is. I'm trying to think, let me see if I wrote down, I don't know if I wrote down. Okay, yeah, I did. So, so last year, um, Manuel Cornu at the at the Maringen World Cup, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Manuel Cornu was seventh, Mikhail Mawim was fourteenth, and Alban Levier was fifteenth. Sure. So they definitely, you know, the the French men definitely performed better uh, yeah. last year than they did here at the start of the season. Definitely. Um, which is just you know not particularly um, indicative of of how they'll do or not do this year but it's just interesting to compare last year the where the french team was at this world cup competition compared to where they were where they are this year yeah and actually now that you mentioned mikhail specifically like that's that's one where i thought you know i feel like he's one of those guys that could have a great chance of uh, of being an olympic medalist um he's also an excellent personality like he's the kind of person that you would want to do really well i think he would attract so much really good media he's the kind of guy that could benefit from uh, the the kind of like sponsorship opportunities because he's got this really compelling personality and his social media presence is awesome. Like I want somebody like him to do well because he's a colorful dude, right? Mm-hmm. He could really milk it and excite people about who climbers are. Whereas you look at some other climbers and you're like, yeah, he's one of the best climbers in the world. Not that charismatic, not, you know, not quite the kind of person he's not, you know, I think Mikhail is like an excellent sports person. And so I, I would really like him to show up because he's one of the guys that I think would be a really cool ambassador for climbing being like one of those sports of the future. But yeah. Yeah. And that's what I mean. And that's uh, that's what sponsors and advertisers, especially with the Olympics, that's what they're going to want. They're going to yeah. want the personalities uh, because that's kind of what sells to the general public more so <laughs> or maybe in a different way than, than can you imagine like adam andra in a coke commercial like tr- like trying to somehow manicure this guy into like looking at all like a model or an athlete just this lanky dude his neck like yeah mikhail would look way better that's my new metric is mikhail and ashima those are like perfect 
Coca-Cola swigging commercial models. They would look great on a box of Wheaties. Yeah, and, I don't and know Ashima, if some other people would. <laughs> yeah, and Ashima has done. She's. I don't know. I don't know if she did commercials, but she's worked with Coca-Cola before mm -hmm. uh, for sponsorship or advertising or some something a, a couple years ago. And so we, you know, that like somebody at Coca-Cola there climbing on their radar. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. I have a, I have a feeling Andre's going to be be stuck drinking Pepsi or RC Cola or whatever the third tier <laughs> cola is after this. But anyway, yeah. So uh, so aside from the field, how did you enjoy the like the event itself? Did you have a good time watching it? Was it like somewhere we were kind of talking about rating them on a number scale or a letter yeah. scale? Let's actually use that as a starting point. Um, where yeah. does this thing fall for you? Let's grade it like a, let's grade it like a paper in school. Are you giving it like sure. a B plus, A minus, C so minus? I would give it. So just to be, to be clear, I I watched it. I and we were talking about this before we started recording. I watched the semifinals live and I watched the finals live. Okay. And then I I rewatched the finals. So the the finals when I'm just thinking about the comp as a whole, like the finals are definitely kind of more solidified yeah, in my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more finals. people watch finals. Like, you don't even really yeah. have to use semis if you don't want to. Right. Well, and I think grading, I, I probably give it like an A minus. Mm -hmm. um, because, and, and I, we haven't really talked about what criteria we're using for no, grading. No. Like, what's our <laughs> you know, for grading. Yeah. But uh, I, I think... A, a couple things, a, a couple reasons why I would choose an A minus. Why would why I would give it an A minus as opposed to like an A or as opposed to a B plus or B. Um, I think at the at, in qualifiers, I think maybe the setting was a little soft, as you kind of pointed out. We saw we were seeing a lot of people top. At least for the men, uh, yeah. At least for the men, right? Good point. Um, so I was thinking the the setting might be a little soft, but as semifinals and and finals. Uh, progressed. I think the setting, the separation was was really good, um, and especially in the finals. I think you had, in terms of people that topped everything. I think Andra topped all four. Mm -hmm. But that was it. Holders, and yeah. then in the women, I think Yanya and Akio topped all four. I think that's is that correct? I so you had two women. Double check. Uh, in finals, no, uh, they only topped three. Only top three. Okay. Yeah. Well, even better. So yeah, because uh, Yanya didn't top the first one, right? right. Where she got that's super right. taped up. Yeah. Hole. She was put in the hole, which yeah. was, which only goes to my point about it being a, a great comp. It was. Yeah. It, there was a there was an interesting narrative for the women with with Yanya, who's kind of generally considered as the the best, right, mm -hmm. or one of the best. She was in the hole, so she had to kind of come from behind. And on the men, you had um, you had Andra. Uh, just always coming out last and always having to kind of to stay in the hunt. He was having to duplicate whatever the five competitors who had who had yeah. gone before him did. Yeah. Um, and so the there was nice separation. I think we always have to mention the quality of the live stream, right? Sure. The, and <laughs> that, the, I didn't have any problems with the the, the yeah. stream cutting out or anything like that, which plays into the the grade ultimately um, for the enjoyment factor. Um, and I think there was a nice mix of of veterans with people like like Adam Andra and and Oceana McKenzie, like new newcomers, yeah. you know, or new relatively new faces. So so that's always nice too. That pl that played into my my giving it an A minus as well. Um, I think the reason I would not pick a higher grade than an A minus was because in the men's field you had four. Of the same country, sure. <laughs> right? <You have laughs> and it's hard because that's certainly not a, a knock on the Japanese team. That's phenomenal that they were able to do that. But if you think of the World Cup, kind of as it in its in its ideal form, the World Cup is you, you think of you're going to have these competitors from from all over, uh, from a bunch of different comp countries competing. And so it, when you have four out of the six in in one field being from the same country. Um, I, I don't know. It's just I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but it's just kind of not um, what you envision when you think of like a World Cup, an ideal World Cup sure. final. Well, yeah, ideal final would have one competitor from from each country. Or yeah, whatever. the, the sure. men's the men's round was like kind of like like an Asian All Stars like bouldering yeah. cup, and they invited Andra because he's the best in the world. Like, but I mean, I have I'm I not that I'm concerned. I think I'm okay with it. Um, but I have a feeling that's going to be like every World Cup like bouldering world cup this season like i think that's you might have to get used to that one john like yeah well, i hope, I hope I, you get comfortable it. with it right i don't want to i don't want people to take this the wrong way I, I absolutely you know i mean how can you not be a fan of the japanese no team? we're all gonna take it the wrong uh, way by the way but, 
<laughs> but it is. But you know, it's just like I, I think if if it had been one competitor from each, like if you'd have six different countries in the men's final, that sure. might have bumped it up from an A minus to an A for me. Um, but but yeah, it, that is that is something that I mean, it was kind of the case last year too with the the Japan's dominance, and it's I can't see why it wouldn't be the case this year. It seems like every it seems like every competition, every World Cup event, uh, it's like there's a there's a new Japanese competitor who, mm -hmm. who maybe was in previous competitions just kind of middle tier and all of a sudden seems to be peaking. And yeah. um, just yeah. when you, you have I, the Japanese team figured out, which for the men, just when you think it's like, okay, it's Kokoro Fuji, Rei Sugimoto, you know, Tomo Narasaki. Yeah. Those are like, you know, you think you have like the, the yeah. collective of who's going to be there. And yeah. then all of a sudden there's like Tomoaki Takata. It's like, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know. uh, it was actually two years ago in Maringen and uh, I was like, I think we were just walking to the venue. I was talking to Eddie Folk and he was kind of mentioning that that's kind of a unique thing about the Japanese bouldering nationals is that you end up with that like that top 10 or the guys that you see at the world cups but the next 10 athletes are equally as incredible right like the the japanese national competitions are an unreal crucible of bouldering talent like you could just probably interchange them you could get rid of the ones we all know and bring up the next 10 and they would probably just crush just as hard like their bench is so deep apparently it's unreal it's it's going to be a real log jam for for, for them, that country yeah. having to choose a, an Olympic competitor, yeah. and and it makes it really hard for for like anybody like us like trying to analyze it. It's like good sure. luck trying yeah. to figure out who. I mean, I think the women maybe is a is a a little not easier because it's mm -hmm. still it could go a bunch of different ways. But but you know it's like Akio and Miho, mm -hmm. and then there are a couple others. Yeah. Um, but with the men, it's just like I mean, there's like half a dozen, a dozen that yeah. any one of them could could kind of get on a hot streak and and be an Olympic, uh, you know, get it get the Olympic invite. So, yeah. well, you uh, heard it here first. John Bergman's biggest complaint about the World Cup is that there's complaint. too many Japanese climbers. <laughs> <laughs> I was so I was actually gonna give it an A minus as well, with the one okay. caveat that because it's the first event of the season, I feel like I'm slanted because I'm always the most excited about the first event of the season. It's like fresh again. You're excited to see this field. You don't really know where everybody is, so there's like more room to actually be thrilled by everything. But all around, it was like a really good event, and I think like I was very briefly in my head last night thinking about what my criteria are and the only ones I came up with for rating it is like first of all are the did the right people get to finals and I'm just going to judge it off of finals um and I think yeah you're you're right about first of all everybody got to finals was strong lots of names you know and people that you want to see climbing could have been better distributed but like everybody were excellent climbers and you got the benefit of one of those excellent climbers being a newcomer right like being a brand new finalist so that adds that extra underdog element and so that was like i think the distribution of the athletes was really really good i was really happy with that um the other part of it was like are there good storylines running through the comp and you're exactly right there were times when every athlete was behind a little bit and then ahead a little bit right off the bat for the men like kokoro fuji not topping number one like pfft, that's kind of surprising, especially for that particular climb was really unique. And the same thing with Yanya, who you would put in as your like first place going in. And then she also can't finish the top. So the dynamic of the climbing was excellent. I thought the boulders themselves were really good. And the one last criteria that I've thought of so far is, did we have something to talk about coming away from it, right? Like, was there a water cooler moment or a water cooler story? And we got two with, like we said already, Oceania and the crack. And we gotta, we have to talk more about the crack. I don't know. After watching finals a couple times, after like seeing social media, how how are you feeling about this crack thing? You know, I so it was interesting because on the broadcast, <clears throat> on the live stream, um, you had if anybody watched the post comp interview with Adam Andra. He yeah. kind of, he said like he feels bad for, <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he seems like, I've, I've never yeah. met him, but he seems like such a nice guy it's, and he's very humble. So it's like, he said he felt bad for the, the, the Japanese team who, you know, just didn't seem as, as kind of adept to do the crack sure. climbing technique. And then, and Zhang Wan Chan, he, he, he tried to kind of skip it and, and sort of ran out of time, uh, skip the move altogether. Um, which kind of, sort of um, shapes this narrative that, you know, Adam Andra's kind of admitting in, in not so many words that maybe he got kind of lucky with the route setting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I think the commentators, Charlie Bosco and Mike Langley, like they kind of said, they, they batted it back and forth a little bit saying like, well, he shouldn't feel lucky because it's, it's like a, you know, it's a, it's a climbing skill and he knew yeah. how to do it. Um, my takeaway from it is like, absolutely. He got, Adam Andre got lucky. Like, I don't know how you yeah. think, <laughs> think that he didn't, because if you, if you think about, if you, if you would have some st- statistic where you would like look at every boulder in the yeah. history of the IFSC world. And Cup. how frequently does a hand jam show up? Yeah, it'd be like a small percentage or maybe like a fraction of the percentage. Yeah. It would be, it would be just minuscule. And the fact that Adam Andra on the last climb, on the last boulder, um uh you know, where he needed to to perform well on it to to win, mm-hmm. it happens to just be perfectly suited to his style and this style that, you know, you never see and that the other competitors aren't aren't as good at. Uh, yeah, absolutely. He got lucky. Um, but I think that being said, there's nothing wrong with that. Like luck is a huge part of any it's, it's a huge part of any sport, right? It's yeah. a, a lucky, a lucky shot, a lucky knockout, a, a, you know, a ball bouncing off the goalpost and going in or whatever. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of like the comp version of that getting lucky with with the route setting. Yeah, and, I think what freaks the hell out of me is like, so first of all, I love like it should be. It is part of climbing, and I totally agree that there should be more crack in these competitions. I think it's excellent, and it like uh, a, a friend of mine, a Canadian route setter, you know, posted on a story like, "Well, I guess they figured out a way to separate the Japanese climbers, right?" Like it is, a, it is a legitimate skill, and if you can argue that. The, you know, the other movements that we see in bouldering are part of climbing, then you can 100% argue that crack climbing is. Um, I wanted to bring up one point. It seemed like that apparently they made that hold custom. I'm assuming that was like flat hold or cheetah guys, some local crew that can actually produce holds quickly. Um, it sounded like it was an ergonomic hold, right? It wasn't textured, so you weren't going to get blood everywhere, which is a huge consideration that I don't think previous comps have thought about especially when i think of like old american comps like when you're like jamming two motivation volumes together like you're gonna you're gonna make some knuckles bleed so that was really cool but if you take all of this together of like it was a, a a person's decision to make a crack climb and there was enough forethought to them doing a crack climb that they had time to like produce a hold for it and make sure that like i'm not sure what came first setting the outline and then producing the hold to fit in that gap or making the hold and then building the problem around it but that was a premeditated problem right in fact they didn't even it's not even a hold in the ifse hold pool so that was entirely premeditated by a group of professionals uh of root setters and manufacturers i don't know how high up in the ifsc that decision went if the root setters needed any permission to bring in a new product that has never been used before but that's the part that creeps me out about the possibility for unfairness in this sport um and we've we all know this like it's as a youth coach you know that sometimes you go have your team climb at a gym and you know you have the root setters for that comp are also coaching other kids like there is a lot of crossover in our community right now it's the only way to make money you have to be a root setter and a coach there's a lot of reasons for it but like as much as I want to see more crack climbing, and I think that will solve the issue if everybody evens out, this is one of those things you look at. Like, if this ever happened at the Olympics or anywhere else, you would have to be really, really suspicious, especially if there's money on the line, that mm-hmm. a competition's results could be thrown so huge and those decisions were made by a very small group of people, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that Jamie Cassidy... Like, I'm absolutely not... Um, accusing anybody of trying right. to throw this competition for someone but those decisions they made ended up being a huge decider like such a decisive move it it it's something we really have to like address cuz it's the most blatant proof that that is a possibility that root setters could really throw a field that I've ever seen before yeah but i think the the thing that kind of softens it a little bit is that Probably when they did, when they were kind of premeditating this 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 particular boulder mm-hmm. and and the you know the crack climbing technique, they it was probably I mean they had presumably no idea that Andre sure. was going to be n- not only in the finals but as the last competitor. Yeah. Um, well, know, okay. Here's a like regardless of that, like what do you think your chances are? Like any World Cup, if Andre is on the start list what would you grade his percentage chances at of being in finals? Because for me, 
even though the sport is like pretty volatile, I would say he's like over 75% chance that that guy is in finals if he shows up to qualifiers. Yeah, I think that's a probably about about right. I mean, it's you have to say it's a clear advantage. Like it's it's a definitely um, 75% or, or more. Mm-hmm. Um so you're right. I mean, it's like, yeah, you're looking at the start list, even though we didn't, they didn't know that Andre was going to mm. be in the finals. Um, it, and presumably they also didn't know that the other climbers in finals would be that shit at crack climbing. <laughs> like, yeah. I was, right. I was genuinely surprised. Like, I understand that they are the like definition of new school boulders. Um, and I should also say that I cannot crack climb for the life of me. That stuff looks so goddamn painful and it's not a thing we do in southern ontario um right. but uh i w- i thought they would have a way better set of skills than they did like it was kind of that was n- probably one of my least favorite problems because of how boring it was mm-hmm. until adam sent it yeah i think that's fair i you know the the thing that kind of the all, one of the things though that makes me kind of like this this fact that they can th- really throw a wrench in things like this is that this really further separates competition climbing from any other, you know, outdoor climbing or whatever you want to call it. This idea of, of they can throw these twists and turns in there with a particular type of route that might better suit one climber and not the other. Um, you're not going to get that on an outdoor. I mean, when, you know, if, if, if somebody's projecting something outdoors, they're going to know, they're going to work on it for a long time. They're going to know all the moves. They're going to work on all the techniques Um, whereas at a competition you can, like the Japanese competitors did, you show up and you're just sort of stymied by, by whatever the root setters have, have given you. Um, I think that's really fun. I think that makes it, I think that, that really differentiates competition climbing. Um, so I don't disagree. Like I, the reason why I'm such like a partisan gym climber, like why I love plastic stuff so much is because there is an element to it that other sports don't have. There is like this this human multiplied by human element in sport climbing. You never yeah. know what you're going to get and it's the subject of somebody's creativity. I love that part of it. But this was such a, a huge example of, of differences in the field, but also so much independence for the root setters that they were able to... Like Anyway, all yeah. of it is very cool and at the same time, it exposes this like worrying area um, for, mm-hmm. for, you know, not so above board, um, root setting possibly, let alone judging and all that kind of stuff. So it worries me a little bit. It was dope as fuck. Like that was a sick attempt. That was the yeah. best way you could ever finish a men's round, but it, it's still like, it leaves a bit of you just being nervous for the future. Well, you know, let me, let me ask you this, because this would totally change the dynamic of, of kind of how competitions go. But what if you... What if competitors during their their four minutes on the on the boulder or you know whatever could could talk with their coach, um, like thinking about other sports, right? Yeah. Like like climbing has this weird this weird separation, this chasm between the competitor and the coach during yeah, during the actual you know during the actual um, athletic performance, which other sports don't really have, right? right? If you think about soccer, if you think about baseball, if you think about basketball, like you're, the team is constantly in communication with with the coach yeah um so if like the japanese team you know if you would have a coach who they would try some technique and and it wouldn't work and they could go and deliberate with their coach for 30 seconds or something and their coach could kind of tell them tweak something and then they could go up and try again um that might that might kind of lessen the the surprise factor or the stymied factor, people getting totally shut down on on a technique that they just simply aren't very good at. Yeah, like I, again, so as somebody that knows like nothing about crack climbing, I stick my hand in it and I walk away. Uh, I don't know how long it takes to go from being crap at it to being good at it, but that is an idea that I've always found really intriguing because I think my favorite parts about any sport is about like the decision-making from the athletes and strategizing. And I think that would add a layer to competitive of climbing that I would find really uh, interesting. So I really like that idea. And maybe it would have but like, well, let's say, I don't know how much experience you have with crack climbing. I don't think Indiana is like known as like a, yeah, right. a crack climbing mecca um, or if any gyms near you have cracks or whatever. But um, I, I can't really answer this question. I don't know if you can, but do you think 
in this particular instance, that would have made a huge difference. Like there are certainly areas where like, and here's the thing is in that case, you would kind of have to assume the coach would also be in isolation. Otherwise they'd be able to see all the other athletes and there would be an unfair advantage according yeah. to the current format. But like, do you think a coach could really tell them or teach them how to use their hands in that kind of move that quick? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's definitely like, you know, all my friends who are trad climbers, like they're going to say like, yeah, it's climbing, trad climbing, doing those hand jams is a real skill, Yeah. Uh, which is absolutely true. And it takes time to get really great at it. But I think to learn the basics of it, like Andre even himself said, it's not, a re it's not real complicated. You just kind of have to no. know how to do it. You yeah. just have to know the mechanics. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know in that situation. I mean, yeah, you would, you would think maybe the coach wouldn't be as wouldn't be very good at it either. I don't know. Um, you know, in other sports, coaches have like a playbook and stuff. So sure. if nothing else, you could at least have some sort of reference that you could be scrambling to tell your to tell your competitor. Because I would imagine just even like little tweaks would probably make a big difference. Um, or I mean, let's think about this: like Zhang Wan Chan skipped the crack altogether, yeah. right? And so that's something that the Japanese, like a coach, could tell their their competitor. They could mm -hmm. say, hey. You know, you're struggling on this, but you're fantastic at moving dynamically. So let's just see if we can skip this crack. Um, that little insight would be really helpful. And that could have, you know, I don't know if the Japanese competitors thought to try to skip it, um, but that could have changed. I'm sure it must have crossed their mind after those first couple of birds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm right. sure they were eyeing like every little thing, trying to find cracks in between those volumes and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, that was, uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, well, actually, let's, let's, let's kind of talk about, um, in terms of the problems that were set, uh, I don't know. I'm. Can I even pick two of my favorites? Yeah, I'll like. Okay, let's say from finals, mm -hmm. if you could pick your favorite men's problem and your favorite women's problem, whatever criteria you want, where do they fall? Start with your men's. Okay, for the men's, as I was like in the moment, I was thinking that my favorite was going to be just at the start of the finals. I was thinking that it was going to be men's one because okay. I loved that that opening kind of dynamic toe hook side, yeah. sort of like the sideways toe hook um i thought i thought that was really fun um but then i think i, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head but i think like most guys ended up topping it yeah um, it was everybody but kokoro yeah but yeah so which kind of lessens it a little bit because it it just was probably a little soft um i think probably men's two was my favorite and i've looked around on the internet a little bit it seems like a, a, other people other fans who watched the the live stream seemed to like men's two also. Um, for anybody listening to this that doesn't remember what it was, it kind of you sort of started um, like mantling off of a volume, uh, and then it was like an inside stem mantle. Yeah, right. Into and like a dynamic to, throw with a toe hook. Yeah. Yeah, and I think some people like pressed up into it, and then yeah. and then you had to do like this double hand, like this sort of hand flip. Uh, there was just a lot of interesting movement there. Oh, in the beginning, I think had there was like a toe hook in the beginning, yeah. so there was some coordination there. Um, just a lot of different interesting moves that that never seemed to let up. Right? It, mm -hmm. It's like the 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 press at the beginning was tricky. Um, getting getting next getting into like the blue scoop volume, whether you grabbed it or whether you did a you know the upward press, that was tricky. And then doing the hand flip was tricky. Um, so there's just interesting moves that and and consistently pretty tough. And and there was nice. I think like four out of the six uh topped it if i'm i i think yeah see. i have i have Remember that yeah, yeah 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 it was just um, the bottom two like jong wan right. and tomoaki that didn't get it yeah yeah so there was some nice separation you know four out of six is is a little that's a little much maybe but um but I just love the boulder. Yeah. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was, I, it was interesting that you said you thought number one would be your favorite because coming into it, I was, I every like my entire life became about that crack problem once it became clear that that's what was about to happen. But then number one became my favorite. I like, so first of all, Tomoaki comes out, he's the bottom seated qualifier and he flashes it right away, which was cool because he hopped into that start position with so much ease right like he first attempt just cartwheeled onto the wall holding this thing and that was a really rad start uh and then of course just flashed it um but then as you went through the rest of the climbers there was you know other climbers who i'm more familiar with and who i rate as higher than him who were taking multiple attempts just to achieve the start and then as you get through the climb there was the risk of that like foot slip so i i really that ended up being my favorite climb just because uh 
Yeah, I don't even know how to how to describe why I liked it so much. I think because there was a lot of progression and lots of opportunities to fail, even though every move was probably softer than other moves in the climb. Like the start probably wasn't that bad. You just had to coordinate everything. And the finish also wasn't that bad. You just had to keep your feet on. So that one ended up being my favorite one. It was kind of fun holding your breath, hoping like, okay, are they going to establish it? And then are they going to finish it? The, the one with yours, I personally felt like I was just kind of getting bored watching people fail through that sequence so much. And it was cool when they got through it. But that one, I was kind of tuckered out by that point. I think number one for the men was my favorite. Do you, do you think that number one, I, because I was, when I was trying to pick a favorite moment of the comp, like an mm -hmm. actual singular isolated moment, um, I originally, I was like, it's kind of like I, I'd give honorable mention to Tomoaki's yeah. just flash of that. It yeah. was remarkable. And I think, do you think that was probably, that was like a, a record for the fastest send in the history of <laughs> IFSC boulders? I, I don't oh. know if they keep those type of statistics, but I Definitely up, not. Obviously they don't because they have, yeah, anyway, that's a yeah, whole other well, topic. Well, I went, I went back and I, I, I timed it actually because I was so mm. curious because it was, it was literally, literally one of those minutes where it's like I went to just like pour more coffee and then yeah. I came back and it's like he, he did it. Um, yeah. And it was so from the time he started – from the time he actually started to the time he topped was like, I counted 34 seconds. Yeah, That's I, I, I do that. remember him walking off and the clock still having more than three minutes left. So I was super impressed. Yeah. I mean, when that happened, I was mostly impressed by that start move because I thought that was really cool. And once he had flashed, I thought, okay, well, this problem's over. Like, this is going to be a gimme for everybody. So I think I was initially, like, I was impressed by him, but... Mm -hmm. I thought at that point that the problem was a write-off and that it was going to be a useless problem with six flashes. So my interest in it increased over time as you then saw Zhang Wan come out and flub the start a couple times. And then, of course, Kokoro not even finishing it at all. That was really intriguing. And, of course, he redeemed himself on the next problem. So I don't, I don't know if I'd rate it that high because I had really mixed feelings right at that moment. I was like, damn, this guy had nailed this, but also that must mean everybody else is going to nail it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and and also I think when I'm when I was thinking about what was my favorite moment, it you know you don't want to say the first competitor on the first men's problem is the, <laughs> is the highlight, right? Like yeah, that's... <laughs> that means you didn't watch the whole final. <laughs> yeah, it's like a book report, right? Yeah. You're only talking about the first chapter. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it, yeah, like I said, honorable mention. Um, you'd be hard to say it was the highlight of the whole competition because there yeah. was a lot of other neat stuff. Sure. Um, but I like that boulder too. I I, I don't disagree with your logic at all it was really neat yeah. the start was cool um and it, it it's always interesting whenever you have those instances where the first competitor comes out and just makes it look super easy and then you kind of just think oh well everybody's gonna flash this and and then you know the next competitors struggle and struggle um you know it's, it's just always fun to kind of see that mm -hmm. and to be proven wrong yeah, I think and I think that my same rationale is why I chose. Uh, oh, was it number two or number three for the women? Damn it. Uh, the st yeah, number two. So the one where it started on the slab where they were just mantling and then they had to move out to the right through yeah. some slab movements and then into that steep with that big yeah. uh, reach up. That was my favorite for the women. I, again, loved how everybody was seeing progress. In this instance, there was a lot of different beta, especially trying to figure out how to get into a launch position to reach that undercling screw on. Uh, that one was so much fun and adding to that that it was Oceana's top which was a huge moment again I thought she might go through the whole finals without a top and that was the moment where it was kind of clear that she you know was legit um, but then they also had that camera that they always bring that one kind of uh, overhanging camera that they mount over a problem and it was the perfect use of that that was like so great especially for Petra's attempt on it that was really sick and it it one of the few times where I want to like commend camera placement for an IFSC broadcast. I thought that was ex like a really well chosen angle and uh, and a great problem that whoever said that. I thought it was wicked. Yeah, I think that was my that was probably if I had to choose a favorite women's problem that you know that would be my favorite boulder for the women's as well. Um, and and the, as far as the camera, yeah, that's something that I'm always curious about going into these seasons. Is are they you know are, are there going to be any new camera tricks, production tricks mm -hmm. that the IFSC is gonna is gonna kind of implement? Um, and and usually, the, I mean, if I think if you watch the competitions from the past few seasons, it's been pretty standard camera work, mm -hmm. um, except for maybe the instances where it's it's you know contracted out to like a local television uh, network sure. or something in the country. 
But um, but yeah, that was great. That was a really really good use of that camera. Um, so I hope I hope we just see more kind of clever camera placement. Yeah. As, let's as, let's talk about production then, like because yeah. I I that's the thing that I am too ornery about, and I think just because that's my that's like my hobby in climbing is broadcast stuff, and it's something I'm really interested in. Um, I always have like a lot of nitpicks, and I don't want to make this sound like I didn't enjoy the event, but I feel like there's a very long laundry list of things that the IFSC should already be doing or that their subcontracted broadcasters should be doing. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the one that I'm, I'm going to gripe on this until they get it perfect is it's still ridiculous that at any point in semis or finals, the clock isn't on the screen. Like, I think we had to wait a couple minutes before we had a clock, maybe even a couple competitors in semis before there was a clock there. And even in finals, there were moments where there wasn't a clock on there. I'm not going to make my argument again. That's in a different video before that the clock is one of the most like fundamental parts of competitive climbing as a sport. Just have it on the screen i don't know why it's that hard like that should be fixed um but was there anything from your end that you thought was impressive or could uh, improve uh you know the clock is definitely a, my, my the two things that i i wish every competition would would have is a clock it, it just seems like a no-brainer to me is to mm. have a clock always have a clock and to always have the score yeah uh because especially if you're trying to grow the sport and you have people that are watching it for the first time they're gonna just that's they're gonna want to know how much time is left and who's who's winning yeah like that's 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 kind yeah. of sports boiled down to its to, yeah. <laughs> to its basis yeah and i'm like just for myself at least i am more like straight up i am more interested in the horse race and like where the scores are at and what people need to achieve in order to like progress i'm more interested in that when i'm watching than i am of the actual rock climbing which sure. makes me like a terrible person probably but that's what keeps me engaged is the, um, you know, the the situational stuff, the context of like, why does it matter that, you know, Tomoaki flashed that compared to Kokoro not uh, not sending it at all? Why does it matter that Adam topped it? Like, if you just had video of Adam Andre climbing that uh, that crack, that wouldn't mean very much, save for the context of the five guys ahead of him not getting it. And he's the last guy out. It's that perfect, like, th you know, bases loaded, like, last batter, like, three strikes, three whatever. I don't know baseball. Anyway, you need to present all of that context for people to understand why these moments are so awesome. Um, so yeah, the clock for sure. Scoreboard, I thought the scoreboard was actually really good, the one they had, like it, it's not perfect. I it, Sometimes it was hard to like immediately see who had bonuses and who didn't because the, the colored boxes were all jammed so close together. It was kind of hard to differentiate like whose color was who and stuff. But that also, like that score box that they had was small enough that it could have completely been on the screen the whole broadcast and it wouldn't mm -hmm. have blocked anything. So yeah. I, I hope they just keep that on there all the time. That would be nice. The one thing I guess is that it would reveal how their scoring is not always exactly live right like i was watching some of the the final four stuff yesterday and you know the second a basket is scored that number's on the screen we know that with the ifsc and the system they use it could be you know it could be 30 seconds before that gets updated which can be really misleading so hopefully they can resolve that and they get the scoreboard up yeah i mean it's i mean it's all i realize it's all about funding and it's all about money because to 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 implement new technology is expensive but you think about other sports like tennis, right, where they have like if ever there's a controversial call, they immediately have the camera that like zooms in on the line to see if the <laughs> ball was like in or out. OK, I've, I've always wondered, like, is there room for innovation? And I think there is somewhere yes. with like inside the holds or something. Could you put sensors to tell like that could measure, you know, how long their hands were on it? And, yeah. and you know, that could detect you know control or or not i and and if you had something like that then i think scoring could be instantaneous yes um and and take the possibility of human error out of it and 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 i think that that's especially i mean it, maybe it's more so with with lead than with bouldering but especially with like a lead climb i mean i think since every hold is scored as the competitor goes up the wall you should mm -hmm. just as soon as they get the hold like a little you know something should blink on the screen and their sure. and their score goes up just like in you know other sports when they score a basket like you said it you know the, the score immediately goes up it it should have something like that on the wall for lead climbing as well mm -hmm. um it would cost money to 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 kind of think about that sort of technology and create it but 
I think it's certainly possible. Yeah, it's I mean, definitely possible. Yeah. And I know there's people working on that kind of thing. Um, and the two sticking points, one creative, like creatively, I think most of the electronics that they're running for those kind of, like you talked about, um, like a force measuring hold, mm -hmm. that needs to be installed across every wall that you use it for, right? So you would need those walls and those systems to be at each location. Plus, I think they're also right now like bolt dependent. I think the either like, what am I trying to say? Uh, so if you're measuring the force on a hold, if there's a force plate attached to that, it has to have an anchor point, which I think they use as um, uh, like they use the bolt hole for. Let's mm -hmm. say the start position is on like one of those giant screw on fiberglass volumes, then you lose out on that capability just because of how it's attached and where you would anchor things. So I, I like I, th I think the possibility is there. I think it's so expensive that it's not a reality for like another five or ten years. Um, but definitely like long term doable. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that's super true. Yeah, I think I want to say like. Anyway, I think I remember hearing uh, like that the guys at Tension Climbing were messing around with force plates, um, mm -hmm. and then I think Luxov, which is the the company, they're actually one of like the the what do they call them IFSC supporters. You see the Luxov sponsor on a lot of their crap. Yeah. They make the light up holds. They've also been working on uh, on force sensing uh, holds, or maybe they were doing like um, what do you like capacitive touch stuff, where just mm -hmm. like if their skin contact it measures a system. So people are messing around with it, but I th I think it is too far in the future for it to be like a, a reasonable uh, thing for now. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that I, I really wish existed for this and it there was a couple of those climbs where there was a lot of like volume slapping um, and then of course climbs where you get screaming and like really good uh, reactions from the climbers. I would really love to see just like shotgun mics hung over each problem so that I can hear like first of all, Andra going nuts on that crack, but then also when like Yanya is dynoing from those uh, those fiberglass volumes to others, I want to hear that smack. Like it's kind mm -hmm. of that satisfaction you get when you're watching golf and you hear that club nail the nail the ball uh, at every tee. It's because they just have a little microphone there on the ground, just pointed at the tee, right? And yeah. you get that sound, and it it adds so much to that moment. I would really like it if we could mic up actual boulder problems so that you can hear more of that intensity. Yeah, that'd be great, and and that would be an easy production tweak, you know. Um, that Maybe, would be, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, all I, all I would worry have... about is how much ambient noise there is in the room. Like, if there, if we keep up this weird tradition of having DJs at every World Cup, and there's just like, you know, whatever weird Euro songs are playing in the background, then yeah. it it might actually be hard. I don't know. I feel like it wouldn't be one of the most expensive changes, but maybe there's a, uh, you know, maybe ambient sound would be a problem. I don't really know. Well, and that's, you know, that brings up another thing that I thought was worth mentioning. There was this, there was a moment when I, I, I want to say it was maybe Akio was on like women's two, maybe. I can't okay. remember off the top of my head, but she was, she was going for um, a move that kind of required her to be slow and, and methodical. Sure. Um, yeah. The start of women's two is about right where she traverse out to the rights. Something, yeah, yeah, I think, and and the and the the crowd, the, the and, and and the commentators even pointed this out that the the yeah. crowd and the DJ were kind of instigating a, a, a momentum that sure. she didn't want in that moment. You know, yeah. they, the crowd was like clapping and getting going. The and, old the, the old Euro clap on four, like just yeah, the exactly. The and the DJ <laughs> was you know kind of amping up the music, yeah. and yet the and, and the opposite. Akio had to go slow. It, it's like she wasn't amping up for a big jump. She yeah. was. She wanted to take her time. And the commentators pointed out that there was this kind of disconnect with what the competitors were sort of forcing her to do, yeah. or at least encouraging her to do, uh, compared to the actual required movement. Um, that that's that brings up an interesting question. I know you have some some thoughts about this as well, which is like. Should I mean you mentioned golf? Should should competition climbing when you watch it should it be more like golf where there's no DJ, the crowd is completely silent? Um, yeah. You know because if if I mean if you were Akio in that in that instance, you you know you could understand why she might be a little frustrated if she didn't end up getting the move and she had she had kind of done it dynamically, uh, encouraged by the crowd to do it that way, and and yet that wasn't how it was intended to be done. I. 
I, I don't know. I, no, I, I, you... I totally feel you, man. And I think like, um, I think it was at the world championships. There was discussion. I can't, I don't remember who the climbers were. I think it was on one of the lead climbs where some climbers had a much faster paced song and some climbers had a slower paced song. And I think this tie, it was a tie and it was broken by time. And so some people were arguing that the person that climbed it faster had the, the faster tempo song, which it is I don't know if it is the reason, but it is a legitimate uh, reason. Like it does absolutely change how your body works when you're responding to like different kind of like oral stimulus and stuff. Um, yeah. So like, I don't want to say I want to make climbing actually like people golf is such a good um, comparison to climbing. It's probably the only comparable sport in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'll, we'll probably talk about this a lot in the future. Um, but in terms of sound, like I, first of all, I don't really enjoy the, the DJ kind of thing, especially when it's like pop hits and whatever. I personally wouldn't mind a more like ambient, very consistent beats per minute throughout the comp. But if you imagine an excellent MC, something like Liam Lonsdale is doing a great job of his uh, of his position whenever he's MCing these comps. And I think if he had the guidance of, hey, we're not going to play music or it's not going to be that loud. We want the tension and the excitement to come from the climbing. And it's your job as an MC to almost act as a commentator and create that waves of the, the high moments and the low moments and the intensity and the, the calm. I think a great MC could basically manipulate the crowd to uh, to create the noise needed to make it sound intense, right? Like from a viewer perspective, if somebody tops a problem and you don't hear anything on the stream, it doesn't sound that impressive. You want to hear that explosive noise come with a big success or an awesome move being stuck. Um, but I don't think it needs to come from music and music will never be that responsive to the moment. So yeah, you're gonna have those moments where the DJ's playing that like weird do 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 which they've been playing for like 20 years, it feels like. I don't know why Europe loves that song so much. Um, but if you start that song and then yeah, it's a Keo on a slab, I don't wanna listen to that. You yeah. made a bad yeah. call. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, for year, for years, I remember like when whenever Jain Kim would climb, it was like Gangnam Style was like the <laughs> song that would be playing in the background, which I was, you know, with all with all due respect to yeah. my friends in Korea, like I don't know if I would want that to always be the song that I was, sure. that I was climbing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it'd be interesting to get a competitor's perspective on this because yeah. I think you know whenever they talk about this, what you always hear is they say that they they're just able. I mean, they're 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 good enough and they're experienced enough usually that they're able to just kind of ignore all this, right? It's yeah. like, it's almost like you get in the zone, you don't hear the music, you don't hear the crowd. Um, but I, I think it, it's this larger question of like, what type of atmosphere do you want to, for, do you want a climbing competition to have? Do you yeah. want it to have this festive kind of party atmosphere, which is definitely more f enjoyable for like a, if you just go to like your local gym for like yeah. a weekend, like a local comp, you know, you don't want that to be like silence, right? You want it to sure. be like festive. You want there to be a DJ there and stuff. But I don't know if we want that same standard applied to the World Cup circuit. Yeah, um, maybe not. Maybe not. You know, I, I, it, it's it's hard to it's kind of hard to even talk about it too much because it, it would be just so different. We've never seen a comp really in recent memory, at least that that's like total silence. Um, or, or at least where silence is encouraged. And like you said, the, the DJ is only kind of amping up the crowd in between the competitors. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's, that's such a hypothetical at this point that it's hard to see how that would work or whether that would be ultimately good or not. I think, I think every, so every country should get to decide what the music is. And you know how they had those, uh, those three people playing, I don't know what it's called, like the Alp horn or the Alps horn, that big, long, like Ricola horn. I yeah. think every country should choose a grossly stereotypical style of music from their country and just have that playing the entire time. So I want that trio that did the metal presentation. Yes. I want them just playing that for the four hours of finals. I would and agree. that adds to the, the flavor yeah. of the world cup. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's I, I'm trying to think now what the American kind of instrument would be. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's everybody's cool. favorite. The banjo, obviously. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I can't say I've ever, I, you know, I love I, banjo music's great. I can't say I've ever heard it at a competition, but well, uh, get ready for Vale, man. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, right. The, 
<laughs> yeah, see you there. We fixed uh, the World Cup. We did, Go right. On. Yes, you heard it here. I, you know, another thing, though, that I'll mention, this, I, I, I was just reminded of this. I think we could also have a discussion about the, the scoring in general of, of the, the competition, yeah. Boulder yeah. scoring. But um, in terms of production, there was a moment in semifinals when the women, were, they were on a boulder, and their, 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 I think it was their left foot was kind of dangling over a, a, a an advertising label that was okay. on the wall, and and I the the commentators were kind of like crossing their fingers or like please like no right. more controversies with the with the logo the, the signage, signage yeah <laughs> on the wall and and it, there didn't end up being any any controversy this time or any yeah. issues with it but it just like why do why why do these competitions continue to have signage? On the wall. I mean, I know obviously for branding and for advertising, there's a there's a draw there. But it's like you're just asking for people to be for the competitors to get into a sticky situation. Yeah. You know, there's got to be a solution, like in other sports where maybe the the signage is is put on the wall, kind of in post production, right? It's not actually a a physical sign, but it's digitally imposed yeah. there during the broadcast. Um, just so you're not you're not inviting this this possibility of 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 uh, yeah, of controversy. They, I they, I have to totally agree, and I'm I I record like a twenty minute, the definitely the most boring video about competition climbing. If you want to watch about the you know I, I think I call it like obstacles in the field of play, that's probably not worth rewatching. But yeah, I agree. Um, and I the. I don't know. I, I also, if you, yeah, I think I've already made my points, whether yeah. or not people have watched it, it's kind of a boring video, but, um, but yeah, I think I, th yeah, I think that's a totally valid position. Um, I mean, oh, we're still, we're still running into it though. It's yeah. like you made that video. I, I, I remember watching the video. I think it was like last season or season. It was after or the world championship. That's right. Yeah. After the, the big controversy. And it's, yeah, yeah it, it's like, we're still, despite that, it's like, we're still, I don't know, we're still running into this. Yeah. Yeah. This issue. Actually, um, I, I just want to. This cop. It was the first thing I wrote down from the entire comp. And on the website, um, there was uh, one of the new like title sponsors for the IFSC is called Earth Corporation. Did you see this logo? Anyway, I found out it's like it's kind of uh, similar to um, I don't know, like a, a Unilever or a Johnson and Johnson. Like it's a huge like you know lots of different like sub products. It's like households. Uh, products and whatever but it's uh, their their brand is called earth corporation it's a japanese company their their slogan is act to, to live or something like that and it just right. sounds like the most like james bond ridiculous like who would right. name their company this anyway it's clear right. we're getting to the olympics when you have something called earth corporation earth corporation yeah it, well hopefully they don't stick their signage you know where yeah the foot can he kind of dangled over it. Yeah, no um, kidding. It just seems like such an easy fix. I mean, I, we don't want to belabor the point, but no. it's just like, why not put that stuff in digitally? Um, I don't, th I, I mean, I would imagine that any intern who has any experience working on basic video production would know how to put the logo in on the, you know, on the live stream broadcast. We just got to make every wall a green screen and then, <laughs> and then we can do whatever the hell we want. You can have, you can have that Adam Andra drinking RC Cola commercial right. on the wall as he's Pop like up. going up the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, now they're climbing the Eiffel Tower. Now yeah. they're climbing the Empire State Building. Now they're climbing, <laughs> now they're climbing on the moon. Use all the classic FaceTime backgrounds, just like oh, right. climbing underwater. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm noticing that, that your video and your audio are starting to desync and we're already like a minute or an hour and 20 into this. Um, so I think we should just call it here. I think we covered pretty much like everything I want to talk about. So I'd like, I don't know. Do you have any final points before we uh, move on? And we'll talk so, about next week, obviously. Two quick points. Um, first of all, yeah, we can get into the scoring on another video. The uh, one thing I wanted to mention that was that was interesting was that uh, they they noted that Gregor Vazonic has opted not. He's one of the few co climbers, few competitors who has opted not to go for the combined, right. uh, the whole combined thing, which could change as the season goes on. Maybe he'll change his mind. Um, but they said that he's doing that in hoping that he can maybe capitalize a little bit on. The fact that other competitors, you know, maybe might be less focused on just the World Cup bouldering season and might mm -hmm. kind of be looking past it to the Olympics. So that'll be interesting to just monitor sure. um, to see to see if if that strategy for Gregor works um, as, well, this, as like, this goes on. We'll definitely talk about this next week. But do, is his end game like that? He thinks he's going to win the bouldering world championship and that will be like a better career move than becoming an Olympic athlete. Cause I feel like that doesn't, 
I feel like he's like, yeah, I'm really hustling my way. I'm going to like swerve on you guys, like, you know, without you yeah. noticing as I steal some gold medals from you. But I don't know what the reward actually is. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I he, he it's he's definitely a rare breed if he does not want to go for the Olympics, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's almost like a no-brainer for most of the other competitors. Um, I haven't spoken to him, so I don't want to speak for him. Uh, it's just an interesting – it's an interesting strategy because yeah. – He's really the only well, as far as we can tell it's like every competitor is is they have their their crosshairs you know over the Olympics and that's yeah. the goal. Yeah. Um so if he thinks he can kind of catch him sleeping or or something like that that'll be fun to follow. Yeah. Um and this the last thing I noticed yeah my my sound is a little uh, the sync is off with my with that's my fine. video but the only thing I wanted to ask was what was your I have a I I I think my highlight I'll just say the, the thing that I would be curious for your highlight moment. What was the single moment that you thought was the most exciting? Um, I've always, I've already said that I think honorable mention would go to the, the men's one, Tomoaki's flash of it mm-hmm. in potentially record time. I also think something that we didn't really mention at all was Shauna Coxie's return. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think it, it, she, when she, when she topped the first women's final problem, um, it was a. It was just a really great moment. I mean, obviously she had had a good competition up to that point as well. But it was just kind of like this affirmation that okay, she's really back after mm-hmm. all these injuries, finger injury, shoulder injury, knee injury. Um, I think it's easy to kind of forget that she before getting injured last season. I mean, she was arguably the best in the world at bouldering. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, you know, so her coming back is a huge, a huge deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, like I, I think that's relevant. I think I do have to admit that I think the biggest moment for me of the comp was Adam Andre jamming one fist in the crack and turning around to the crowd. Like I think that like that's the screenshot. That's the most memorable moment from the comp. It was awesome. Again, I've already like mentioned my like slight concerns about how that whole situation like came to be, but that was such a great moment. I was smiling my face off. It was a beautiful win on an awesome climb. It showed how dominant he was. It kind of reinforces the narrative that he is the favorite going into the Olympics. He's the guy that has the most to lose. He's kind of the, the one everybody's expecting to be the first Olympic gold medalist. I, yeah, I, I thought that was amazing. I don't know if it can, can you disagree with that? Like, do you really think there's something that might top that? No, I, I agree 100%. My, cool. I think all these other things that I pointed out are just kind of, like I said, honorable mention. I yeah. think when, when Adam Andre actually, like if I have to pick an, a moment, it was when he yeah, locked in that hand jam yeah. um, with, with ease. I mean, yeah. it was just like, <laughs> it, it was... looked like nothing for him. That yeah. was just, that was remarkable. Um, it, and, and, the, and the fact that it was the last, like we've said, the last competitor on the last boulder in the men's final that it's just it was kind of like this perfect storm of of just um kind of all these narratives coming together um especially going back to the videos that he has been posting the road to tokyo videos Mm -hmm. how he he went to japan specifically to train with the japanese competitors because they're so good at this new school style this dynamic parkour style uh, and then he he just kind of schools them <laughs> on on that on that move. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I know I saw on Canadian Climbing News uh, they posted a thing. I can't remember who posted it or where it was, but uh, I think the Japanese team is in Innsbruck. I think most of the teams are in Innsbruck in between Meringen and Moscow, and uh, they. The, the Innsbruck gym built a crack for them. They put two big volumes <laughs> together and they're, they're probably going to be running crack clinics for the rest of the week until everybody leaves. So yeah. it's kind of cool that that's like kind of come back to everybody's, uh, um, everybody's consciousness. Yeah. You know? And then we'll, and then, and then they'll, they'll train on that for, for a long time. And then we probably won't see another crack in the yeah, world. Exactly, like exactly. Years or something. Yeah, so, no, totally. Um, but good anyway, for them. Yeah, thanks so much, John. Um, yeah. Thank you. If you clicked on this video, it's the very first one. Hopefully, we'll do it for the rest of the season and maybe beyond that. Uh, make sure you follow John Bergman on Instagram or Twitter, wherever. Same thing for me and Plastic Weekly. And of course, read John's content on uh, climbing.com where he's following the rest of this World Cup season and probably, I guess, through the rest of the Olympic season, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be you know I'll, I'll be posting recaps on climbing's webpage um, the the beginning of the week after every every uh, World Cup, um, so Perfect. people can follow along. Another thing that you know we should mention is if anybody has any stuff that they want us to discuss or any specific questions, they can leave comments and and you we'll try to address them specifically. 
Um, yeah, totally. You know. If you if uh, if you want to argue with us about stuff or if you have uh, questions, drop them in the comments. And we're going to be back. I I think we're aiming again for a Monday release uh, for After Moscow. So if there's anything in the comments by then, we'll do our best to answer them and see if we can uh, uh, help you out if you're not sure. But anyway, thanks so much for watching, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, and we'll Ciao. see you guys next week after Moscow. Have fun.